much. We're talking the surcoats went from noticeably above the knee to right about at the knee. The, the women's gowns seem to have gotten fuller or the artist just got better at showing it. There does seem to be less fullness in the torso of women's gowns. And shockingly, we start seeing buttons on places, especially the sleeves. Also, we don't have that here, but right at the front, which presumably, possibly were for a front opening, although not necessarily all the time. Even the hairstyles seem to have basically remained the same. There's a little bit of difference in regions and what we now consider national differences. But again, most of these are things that you could consider to be just artistic differences. I love some of these English ones. On the next page, we have how the Germans portrayed it. So here you see the buttons down the front, very similar. You do see more gold at the neckline on the German ones. And now we're going to go through the layers. The first layer that we actually see in any of the artwork is what we generally consider to have been cons called the coat. That's a French word, the English called it a kirtle. I would have to look up what the, Eng what the Germans and other people called it, but it was basically the innermost gown that you might see. And these two ladies seem to be wearing just their coats, although you never know those might be an outer layer that's just presented almost identically. The most common outer layer, at least in the artworks, seems to have been the dalmatic. And this style was around since long before the 14th century, and at least in the lower classes stuck around for a bit after that. It's long sleeved, um, gradually became less full up top in the torso. And both men and women wore versions of it. These are some examples of male and female versions of it during this time period. If you look closely, you can see buttons on a few of them, but we're not sure whether those are coats or dalmatics. This lady is in a blue dalmatic over a peachy colored coat. You know, sometimes they're lined. Can't tell if this one is in a coat or a dalmatic. She does have buttons though, which makes me think that she's just in her coat. One variation of the dalmatic had slits in the upper sleeve or where the sleeve attached to the body of the gown so that you can have sleeves on your dress without necessarily putting your arms through it. And we've got four different depictions of that, which gives us a nice variation. We're not sure about this one because it looks like it might be a different type of traveling gown that was basically another version of the Dalmatic but not a standard dalmatic or one with sleeve slits. Then we have the version where they decided to get rid of the sleeves altogether. And this is what a lot of people call the cyclist. It slowly developed into what we now call the sideless surcoat, which is very familiar from late 14th century artwork. Early versions, though, it's like they just made it and forgot to add the sleeves. And then, of course, everybody needs a mantle. A lot of these mantles 
in the artwork appear to just be magically attached at the shoulders. Sometimes you see a cord going across from one side to the other, and they're just a simple half circle. So very easy to make. If there was decoration, it would be along the straight edge, at least primarily, because that's the edge that shows when you put it on. And we have some tradition, uh, some transitions toward the gown that we now call the cotardi. In women's fashions, the neckline got wider, the torso got more fitted, and skirts got longer and fuller. In men's fashions, and yes, men did have fashions, the garments also got more fitted up top, eventually got more fitted in the skirt area too. And now we have a few variations on headgear. I'm not sure how likely the bare head with just the curls showing was in everyday life because of course you want to keep your head warm and your ears and hair clean. But it looks great in artwork. In the men, you have a lot of depictions of them with armor on their heads. Um, arming caps and similar caps were widely worn by men, probably most of the time, including underneath other types of hats. This one is either a hood worn as a chaperon or that funny coxcomb type of hat that's called a chaperon. And of course, if you're royal, crowns were a necessity. And in the early 14th century, crowns are always oversized so that you see them, at least in the artwork. Women's headgear options. We have a few choices here. We have the uncovered hair, which is probably more of an artwork thing than a real life thing. We have probably the simplest hairstyle from the 13th century carrying over a bit. We have women in hair in calls off to the side and she's got some kind of circlet across there. We have braids that are sewn or pinned up. Um, a pair of calls covered by a veil that's flowing in the wind. Calls covered by a rectangular wrapped veil, a veil that's just draped over her head. This one is wearing a um, wimple covered by a veil. There we have calls covered by a veil and just bare braids. Another wimple and veil. And Her Majesty is just wearing a veil at her crown because what else should, does she really need? And when I said that 14th century garb was simple, this is all the instruction you really need for all of it. The body of the coat, the cyclist, the dalmatic, the chemise, basically all cut like this. You might have the back cut longer to make a short train. You might have sleeves attached. This is the basic cut for the coat sleeve. This is the basic cut for the dalmatic sleeve. Your veil is either a rectangle or an oval. And your mantle, like I said, it's a half circle. Very simple. This is something anybody can make if they have any sewing skill or a willingness to learn. And here are some sources. You'll be able to click on them when you get the PowerPoint. And that is it. So does anyone have any questions before I go off into showing off the garb that I personally have and can show you up close? 
how common were patterns um, within the material itself? Pattern fabric like a brocade? Yes. This was a time period when brocades came into their own. In fact, there's a theory that I personally ascribe to that part of the reason for the simplicity of the pattern of the gown and the pattern of the men's clothing was because a simple cut garment can show off a gorgeous fabric a whole lot better than interesting cuts do. Thank you. You're welcome. What about um, block printed? Instead of the fabric being, instead of the pattern being in the fabric, it's printed on top of the fabric. Do you see any of that? Yeah. Um, there are some illuminations where something looks like it might be block printed, like there's a band of gold that's too wide to be just trim. That looks like it's part of the fabric of the gown. But we mostly see that in like books of hours and things where there's a depiction of a holy figure from the Bible. And as far as I know, we're not sure if that actually got done in real life. Might people just paint on the fabric? It would certainly be a possibility. That's not something I've gone into personally in my research. So basically all the um, styles were just one pattern, it looks like? And yes. Can, okay. <laughs> the cut is very similar. In fact, it looks like they're roomy enough that, hey, this fits me, it also fits you. <laughs> what does it matter if it's a little long when I'm going to be lifting my skirt anyway to show the skirt under it or pinning it up? because it's muddy or something. And especially for women, it would work for maternity because you don't need a new dress just because you're pregnant, which you would have been a lot. Yes, you might very easily spend half your adult life pregnant. And so things that look good on a pregnant body are desirable. Oh, and I never changed my name. Uh, it's a very utilitarian style that still looks very elegant and I've recommended it for everybody from the basic newcomer who's just trying to figure out what to wear, can I have something for next weekend, to royals. Is there anything special you do to it to make it for a male shape or? Um, obviously cut it so that it's got a reasonable amount of ease for his body shape. Other than that, just cut it approximately to knee length unless he's either a king or a distinguished older gentleman. In which case it might be almost as long as a woman's. <laughs> Are we ready to look at the clothing? Yes. Okay. So one thing that you will basically never see in the illuminations is the chemise layer. But basically it would be as white as you could afford it to be. And it would be cut basically the same way as the coat. Linen tended to be the fabric of choice for obvious reasons. 
much more comfortable than wool and much better against the skin than silk. This coat is basically what they would wear before the buttons came into use, which would either be something, some tight fitting enough that you didn't need to have a closure, but still had enough room to get it on and off, or maybe you sew it shut every time. So this one, I have sewn it shut every time. I keep the thread there so I don't have to start from scratch, obviously. So that requires another person, yes? Well, it's easier if there's another person. If there isn't, I pull the end till, till it's tight, and then I tuck it in and try to get it attached to one of the loops. Wow, okay. But that's at least one of the possibilities for before the buttons came into use. Would they have, there were, when I say dress hooks or dress pins, which were actually, they'd sew it in, there was a little spiky thing on it. That would be a closure for cuffs. Mm, not that I've come across. I've, I've come across buttons and references to sewing the sleeve shut. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, I was going to show off this gown, which is my favorite coat. It has buttons. And I tried to do an intermediate stage between the sewing the sleeves shut version and the late 14th century one where you have proper buttonholes. So I, this is experimental, this is not a certainty, but I've got a long finger loop cord that's attached in such a way that I can use it to button and unbutton my sleeves. Yeah. Over your coat, you have, is that light bothering anybody? That's okay. Okay. So over your coat, you have a Dalmatic. This one has the basically straight sleeves after you get past the underarm gusset thing. Had to dress it up a bit. In fact, this one might be positively Germanic. <laughs> but it's nice and it's warm. And with such a dark fabric, I needed something bright. And it's very long. In fact, it's long enough that if I don't belt it up, I need to do a pavan step to walk, unless I'm holding my skirts up or something. But I have danced in it. This is an example of a Dalmatic with the sleeve slits. I put these in the seam where the sleeves attach because I figured that was a good first place to experiment with getting the look and it works. With this neckline, I need a brooch there, oh darn. And otherwise it's cut just like the Dalmatic. In fact, the sleeves are long enough and full enough to be completely functional. Do you ever line your garb? I mean, I know you live in Trimeris, but. 
It depends. If I'm making it for Gulf Wars or our two weeks of winter, then, <laughs> <laughs> then yes, I'm lining it as a definite possibility. If I'm making it out of a wool that feels itchy to me, then lining is a necessity unless I already know that my other clothing is going to keep me from touching it. Okay, thanks. Generally speaking, no. <laughs> okay. Now, this is my summer mantle. So it is just one layer of a silk wool blend. Don't think I can get back far enough that you can see the shape. Well, you can see a bit. Straight front edge, let me turn it around. Straight front edge is where I have trim because why bother putting it anywhere else? Especially if you're doing a lady's mantle or a king's mantle and it's basically dragging on the ground. There are illuminations that show a lady in what appears to be just her mantle and her coat. And it's a nice look. Yeah. I have skipped depending on magic though to keep my mantle in place. And I have a string. That's long enough that I can just put my thumb in it and da da da. <laughs> You can also use brooches, but a lot of the artwork doesn't have anything there that looks like a brooch. And a string is much easier to understand why the artists and why the artists wouldn't put it in the illumination. Socks definitely would have been worn. Probably from what I've read, they would be cut from either wool or linen fabric instead of knitted at this point in time. But nobody's going to be able to tell if you use knit stockings instead. Now, I have three veils here. And that's enough to show you any of the women's headgear styles that you'd like to see. Would anyone like to see one in particular? I'd like to see how the wimple was put yeah. on. I've seen them, but... Okay. Well, we don't know for sure how the wimple was cut, but in my experience, the best way to have a wimple is to take one of those veils that you have anyway. And this is a longer one. It's about, actually, we'll say that one before going over top. It's a is little that a rectangle one? You can use a rectangle. I like the look better if you use an oval. Okay. And some of the artwork, it definitely shows an oval. Some of the artwork definitely shows a rectangle, so both were in use. Now, I have taken my veil. This is a longer one, about a meter and a half long. That's about a yard and a half, too. And I folded it in half the long way, so it's half as wide as it originally was. And I take the folded edge, and I wrap that up. And then wrap that folded edge around my chin. <sighs> Easier if I'm not doing this in front of a camera, but of course. Okay. There's the edge.
So wrap that approximately at your chin. Could be a little past, could be a little over. And hang that down. You can do it under, you can do it at the point. And you probably want to pin that in place. I was gonna ask how do you prevent it from slipping? <laughs> in <laughs> pins help a whole lot. Then you take another veil. And this one, you find one of the narrower ends because the length seemed to... Okay, I'm going to not skip the step of pinning it in place because we'll never get past here if I do. Uh, by the way, silk is slippery. It's one of the pretty things about it, but it is slippery. Okay, now I can put this on and have it actually stay. And showing the hair seems to have gotten more and more fashionable as time went on, especially among the French. But then you put the veil over it and you can put that kind of low in front, which I think looks really good. Or you can put it further back. I like it a little lower, kind of like bangs. I find it's easier to put your coronet or circlet on while you're fussing with it. And then pin it in place. There. Lovely. Thank you. And this is much warmer than you would think it is considering I'm just wearing one, two, three layers of gauze. But, you know, a nice warm winter veil might be a much heavier fabric and might be even toastier. Any other hairstyles, or should I try on one of the Dalmatics? Yeah, I like the Dalmatic. Yeah, try on okay. one of those. I should be able to leave the veils on for this. And if you noticed in the artwork, at least in the artwork, they seem to have worn belts a lot less than we prefer to. Um, because we don't dress like this every day and it gets a little cumbersome with lots of loose fabric. And partly because we do like to show off our figures a bit more than they felt like they needed to. I can wear this just like this, or I can belt it. I can lift my skirts so that it drapes prettily. 
although you can't see that anyway, so why bother? <laughs> Um, but here we are. And if I tucked the wimple in, or if I were doing without the wimple, you would see my gold trim. Anything else? Ah, uh, hidden yeah, pockets. <laughs> You could, although I could also wear gloves. Hmm. We love hidden pockets out here in Artemisia. Lots of goodies. I can imagine that. And it's at least if your fabric is a good substantial weight and you don't put blood weights in your pockets, it shouldn't mess up the line of the gown. Do we have any questions about the men's clothing? I know I have a lot fewer examples of that. So are, are men's clothing similar but shorter? Basically the big difference is that it's shorter, except okay. that kings and distinguished older gentlemen wore it long too. But still, for them, we're talking about floor length rather than, oh, I'm pretty sure that's longer than floor length. I know couples like to do the matchy-matchy or, you know, contrasting colors. Was that really period at all? Um, one of the pictures that I showed you, I can go back to it if you want, but one of the pictures that I showed you of the um, dalmatic with the hanging sleeves, had the lady in one color coat and one color dalmatic and her husband in a dalmatic that matched her coat and a coat that matched her dalmatic. Yeah, I noticed that. I wasn't sure if it was just yeah. for the artistic um, presentation or if we thought that really occurred. I have a theory that if the artists show it once, somebody tried it at some point or the artist wouldn't have gone, oh, Maybe I'll show this. Right. Because yeah. they were getting paid to do this artwork. And if people think your artwork is strange, they're not going to pay you. Right. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? The, I can show. The men's headwear is kind of limited. Is is there, is there anything that's popular? Um, going by the artwork, I would say that the simple coif, the simple white cap, was the most popular. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And that white cap would often be worn under something else if you wore something else. So regardless of whether you have a chaperone hat on it, you've got that simple white cap. I think I'm going to show off the Dalmatic with the hanging sleeves just to be interesting. Oh, yes, please. And I think I'm going to take off the wimple and long veil at least. It is much easier to get dressed if you do the headgear after everything else.
nice, comfortable summer look, but we need a brooch. Here we are. And I could belt this or leave it unbelted. Unbelted seems to be more comfortable in the heat of summer, at least for a lot of people. Um, Very nice. Shall I do a different veil style to go with that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Do we have a preference for that different hairstyle? Or hat or veil style? Surprise us. Okay. We'll go with my favorite for this kind of thing, which is just the veil without the wimple. And again, I'm holding this in place while I pin it. It looks more cool, more comfortable. <laughs> Definitely more appropriate for summer weather. Looks like you're ready for merchant row. <laughs> for shopping. <laughs> Okay. Very nice. Ready? Yes. Ready to shop, ready to go to uh, court, ready for hanging out with friends. Now we have three more minutes if anybody has any final questions. Um, could we also get the PowerPoint link for people? Yeah, let me see what I can do. All right. And if anybody doesn't get that right now and wants it later, just contact me. I'll put my email address in here. And it's on the handouts or the flyers. Um, right. All right, so I'm posting my email address just so everybody can get that, whether you get the PDF or not. Any last questions before we give up the room? Not a question, but I'd like to say thank you very much for a great presentation. You're very welcome. Yes, thank you. Completely agree. Thank you very much. You're very welcome and thank you.